to you. Okay, okay Sean, go. go ahead. Theme song. Come on, join me. Okay. <laughs> Theme. All right. Okay. So here we are. What the rabbis won't tell you. Episode number two. Welcome, gentlemen, and those of you who are new with us. Looks like there are some new faces here, which is always a pleasure to have. If anyone wants to introduce themselves, by all means, please go ahead now. Luis. Hi, Luis. Hello. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Um, college student, been a Christian for about four or five years, and live in Fresno, California. Cool. Fresno is beautiful. I was there for a few weeks back in the day. Hey, Sean, I don't think your mic's working. Whenever you talk, you're coming through on my computer. Yep. Yep. You, you've got a headset, so why don't you try and get that? I don't want an echo. You don't want an echo? Okay, very well. I believe Michelle Levy has just joined us. Michelle, welcome back. Yep. And Alex, tell us about yourself. Does Alex have a mic? Nope. Sorry. Uh, Alex, tell us a little bit about yourself. Um, I have a fever. <laughs> okay. Sorry to hear that. Yeah. <clears throat> All right. Um, and other people who would like to introduce themselves, please. Hey, I've never seen that guy before. Who are you? Nick. Don't be don't be so talkative, everyone. <laughs> Nick, where are you from? What's your story? Me, I'm Nick. How are you guys doing? Hey, Nick. Nick Tell us look, what's up with you. you look Who like are you? Me. I am in Ohio. I'm hanging out with my beautiful son here. We're just hanging out. Interested in hear what you have to say, Sean? I like. I like your videos. I've watched you for a while. Nice cool. to see you. Thanks, man. And some other friendly faces as well. I'm sure they'll begin to speak as we roll this show out. So where do you guys want to begin? Last week we were talking about, well, is there something the rabbis don't want to tell us? And the natural progression of that question is getting down to specifics regarding topics. What particular things are they perhaps not telling us about? And I think this week we're going to talk about atonement. Atonement, where that word comes from, where it appears in the Jewish scriptures, and what the rabbis have to say about it now. How do they interpret the word? What does it mean to the Jewish people today? Anyone want to begin that conversation by giving an anecdote, a comment, a question, a concern, anything at all? Well, let me just go over some of the ground rules. All right, you want to actually like slide over here? Like, why are you even? Why don't you just log out over there, Sean, and idea. just join me over here? Well, actually, I'm gonna. <laughs> there you go. We can't hear you, Sean. Can't hear us. As I was saying, when I was muted, we are having technical problems, and that only further exemplified precisely what I was talking about when you couldn't hear me. Sean, what were you going to say? Uh, I'm going to go over some ground rules of how this is going to work. Uh, basically, we want everyone in this room to be able to participate uh, and have something to say. Uh, and what you're going to do is write any questions or concerns in the chat so that we don't interrupt each other and uh, we be polite and allow people to speak. And if there are people who are unactive in their audio or are having techno pro technical problems, you may be ejected out of the room. Don't take it personally. It's, it's just how we're going to get things flowing here. And uh, after you've presented your question and you've been here for a while, please uh, leave so we can have room for more people to come in and ask their questions. Uh, raise your hand if that makes sense to you. All right. All in favor. Wonderful. Cool. And with that said, I will be moderating over here. All right. Hopefully we don't have to use the band hammer. We don't want to go 
in that direction, but we will wield it with great ferocious ferocity, ferocity, if necessary. Although you don't look like a rowdy crowd. In fact, you're all putting me to sleep, so I don't think that's going to be a problem. All right, atonement. Who knows where the word atonement first appears in Scripture? Leviticus? No. Close Did you No. Yom Kippur. Again. Uh, Yom Kippur was Leviticus, but let's try again. Uh, Genesis? Yeah, very good. It's a it's a good guess because you you know. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, uh, at least the the nature of atonement appears in Genesis, and I believe, and this is something I'm going to have to do a little bit of research on if I if I am incorrect, but I believe that the word for pitch, which is translated as pitch in our English Bible, which uh, Noah used to seal the ark, pitch is the same word used, or at least the same root word for atonement. For those of you who are. Um, who know Hebrew or, or find that interesting, and I can sort of explain, at least as I've understood it, why that is, what the relationship is between um, the ark, which, you know, is how Noah was saved from the flood, and atonement in sort of the Levitical sense. You mentioned Leviticus, where the priests would offer up sacrifices to make atonement. So Leviticus chapter 17, verse 11, it says the blood on the altar makes atonement for one's life, for it is by reason of the blood that life is reckoned, and I can pull up that verse from the Chabad website if uh, anyone wants to see it. And so, with that being said, I'm going to pass the torch to whoever wants to make a comment right now while I pull up that verse. You see, the danger of me opening up the room and telling other people to talk is, of course, there's always the fear that no one's going to talk and that I'm going to have to fill the void with my voice, and it's not that I don't like talking, guys. I think if you've known me for the last six or seven years, I like to do a lot of talking, but once I start going, I don't stop, and then no one else gets a chance to talk, and I'm just yeah. trying to encourage you guys to just just, just just, open this strange device you have hanging from the bottom region of your face. What sure. exactly is the question you're trying to get at? Um, well, right now we're just asking, where does it appear? And let's look at it and, and try to understand it. And I've got a verse in Leviticus that I can pull up, which may begin and spark the conversation. So tell you what, why don't I do a screen capture? I'm going to go to screen share. I'm going to share my screen. And now you guys should all be able to see what I'm highlighting here. This is Leviticus chapter 17, verse 11. I'm on the Chabad website. It says, for the soul of the flesh is in the blood, and I have therefore given it to you to be placed upon the altar to atone for your souls. For it is the blood that atones for the soul. Now, I really like the word therefore. Whenever I find the word therefore in scripture, I know that it's there for a reason. And it makes sense, you know, you read when Noah gets off the ark, he says if, if uh, someone slays a man, then... By life, you will pay for life, and it's this idea of the price of a human soul. Well, it seems rather costly, and so that that <coughs> seems to be the idea. Man, you're dying over there. Are you okay? Yeah, you're good. All right. So yeah, this verse, Leviticus seventeen eleven, I think sort of lays a very the groundwork, it just shows in a very clear way this idea of ransoming a soul by virtue of blood atonement. And we see that this blood, this idea of blood having um, salvific qualities or um, how, I mean, there, there, there's so many examples in scripture. Um, maybe we'll begin to discuss them. So th that'll be my question. Who has any... Uh, remembrance of an event in the scriptures. It can be taken from only the Old Testament or the Tanakh. Anywhere in scripture where blood was shed for the purpose of saving someone. In any in any context, in any way. Yeah, I'm going to have to go with uh, when he brought his son to the mountain and he said he was going to kill him. And Abraham God's, and Isaac? Yeah. Yes, yes. Okay. And God said, you don't have to kill him. Okay, great. Why don't we pull up Genesis 22? It's one of my favorite verses in the entire, or well, favorite chapters in the entire Bible. Let's go to Genesis chapter 22. 
Now, there are, pri uh, prior to this entire um, Abrahamic event, where Abraham's told to sacrifice his son, this idea of sacrifice was not foreign to Abraham. Um, he had made a covenant with God earlier where there was some sacrifices made, um, although it was God who passed through the offering, and we can talk about how God had made a covenant with Abraham through that. But even earlier than that, I'm thinking like way, way back, the first occurrence of this idea, I mean, we're going to pull up Genesis 22 like I said I, I was going to, but prior to Abraham, even earlier in the book of Genesis, the first event that I can see of where you've got um, blood being shed or a sacrifice being rendered is Cain and Abel. Uh. And so Cain and Abel is probably worth discussing as well. And even before Cain and Abel, when Adam and Eve sinned, you know, they clothed themselves with leaves, and then God took an animal and took its skin and clothed them. So if something had to die, I assume, to skin them um, and cover their, their shame and all that sort of stuff. So even in that, I think we find a, the first inklings or a picture of what would later be called atonement. That may be controversial, but uh, Cain and Abel, I think, clarifies that. And then with Abraham and Isaac, I actually think it, it becomes even more clear. So let's skip ahead to Abraham and Isaac, and if you guys want to go back to Cain and Abel, that would be my absolute pleasure. So while I'm pulling up the verse, if anyone wants to say anything about anything we've talked about so far, now would be the time. Um, what is the earliest treatment of bloodshed in rabbinic traditions? In rabbinic tradition? Define rabbinic tradition. Uh, the Talmud or any other source. What is the earliest uh, touching upon that concept? I'm not sure I'm in a position to answer that. Anyone else have an idea? I don't quite understand the question. What is the earliest uh, appearance in Judaism, uh, the concept of atonement? I, I mean, I believe it's Genesis. But yeah, outside, I, I, outside. Right, you're asking when do the rabbis begin to comment and sort of come to their own understanding of it apart from the scriptures themselves. True. That's what you're asking. Mm -hmm. I would suggest, and, you know, this goes back to the oral tradition, which we see, you know, is, is fairly old, the Babylonian um, captivity. They, they apparently had some, some ideas, because they were no longer in Israel, and so they had to figure out how they could fulfill the sacrificial priestly system that God prescribed, but they were no longer in the land where they were told to do it. And so I think that's where they began to redefine how, how do we do this thing that we're told to do, and yet we're no longer in the context with which to do it. So I think it goes back that far, and that's where you get the Babylonian Talmud, which is the oral traditions mixed with commentaries and ideas from rabbis on how to deal with this fact that the temple is no longer a viable option for them to fulfill the commands uh, found in uh, the Pentateuch or the, the, law, the laws of Moses. Hmm. Anyone want to correct me on that or no, challenge that, it? that sounds pretty accurate. Yeah, I think it does too. Um, yeah, all right, let me screen share something with you guys. Let's look at Genesis 22. All right, so you should be live streaming to my page here. All right, let's see here. This is Genesis 22, right? Yeah. Okay, so Abraham said to the young men, he's going to sacrifice his son now, stay here with the donkey, and I and the lad will go yonder, and we will prostrate ourselves and return to you. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering, and he placed it upon his son Isaac. Um, I found find that interesting, but I'm not going to explain why just yet. Going further, I don't think Google Hangouts is looking at my verse anymore. Hold on. So Isaac spoke to Abraham, his father. Um, so Isaac says, so where's, where's the sacrifice? Where's the lamb for the burnt offering? I'm curious how Isaac knew that it would be a lamb. I suppose that was the prescribed method. And lambs are obviously pretty important in... Uh, Jewish history, the, the Passover, you know, the, the blood of the lamb, and then Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, lambs were slain in the temple, so anyways, let's go on. Um, Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb for the burnt offering. Let's keep going. Scrolling down, down, so Abraham's about to do the deed, and 
and it says an angel of God called to him from heaven, said, hey, um, Abraham. Abraham said, what's up? I don't mean to be irreverent. He said, here I am. He said, so do not stretch forth your hand to the lad, nor do the slightest thing to him, for now I know that you are a God-fearing man, and do not withhold your son, your only son, from me. Now, it's interesting. There's so many rabbit trails we could go on. Why is the angel saying that he was withheld from me? And here in the rabbinic commentary, not commentary, but the translation, it capitalizes me. They would suggest the angel is speaking on behalf of God. It seems to suggest the angel is in some way God, and this goes into the whole... Um, the angel of the Lord in the Old Testament has a very specific title, and never mind. We'll do that another time. That's pretty interesting stuff, though. So Abraham lifted up his eyes. He saw, and lo, there was a ram. That's not a lamb. And after it was caught in the tree by its horns, and Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. Abraham named that place, and this is where things get interesting. The Lord will see, as it is said to this day, on the mountain, the Lord will be seen. Sean? Yeah, go ahead. What does the word Lord mean in this trans? I know that's Hebrew there. What is, what's the actual word that they use for Lord there? Is that Yahweh or, or YH, you know? YH Let me check the Hebrew here. You can, can you guys still see my screen? No, sir. Yeah, it is yud heh vah Okay, so let me pull it up on the screen again, and I'll show you what it is. Can you guys see this? Can you guys see this? So yud hey wa or vav hey. So that's the that's called the tetragrammaton or the, the the name that God gave to Moses in Exodus three fourteen. That's sort of the when when you see um, Hashem in Jewish translations, that's the name. Like that's the holy name of God, the the particular covenant name. Um, so when it says on that mountain the Lord will be seen, here it appears again. So. Interesting enough, now I don't want to go into the, I mean, I, I want to keep this conversation as Tanakh-oriented, as Old Testament-oriented as possible, without appealing to New Testament theology or stuff, because I know as soon as I do that, I'll, I'll probably lose a lot of listeners. And so, the point is this, Abraham goes through this incredible drama with sacrificing his son and this whole idea of atonement getting wrapped into it, and he says, here, on this mount, and... Some translations say the Lord will be seen, which is fascinating in and of itself. Another translation says, on this mountain it shall be seen. And that's sort of ambiguous, but what? What shall be seen? If you interpret this entire event as prophetic, and I can give you reasons for why one should view it that way, this whole idea of a father sacrificing a son, and it just happens to be that this region, Mount Moriah, where Abraham was to sacrifice his son Isaac, this would later be the same region um, where the Temple Mount would be erected, and also where later... Now, this is a large region. I'd have to show you a map, and maybe I could pull up the map. This is also purported to be the place where Christ himself was crucified. And if that's the case, if that's the case, the question is, of course, this. Is Abraham prophesying about one, the day where God would send forth his own son to die for our sins? And I'm not going to tell you guys what I believe concerning that, because... Most of you probably already know, but I throw that out there for you as something to consider if you've never heard it before. And if no one wants to talk about that, I've got another subject we can change too. But I'll let you. I'll open it up. What do you guys think about what we've said so far? Well, well, one thing about that story um, is that it can be looked at that it was never actually God's intention for uh, Abraham to kill his son at all. Sure. And he intervenes before that ever happens. No, I mean, you know, yeah. make whatever interpretations about that later, but, you know, to say that it had anything to do with, you know, it's where God intended first for it to happen make the first time. And then... About that later, but... Ooh, somebody's mic is, like, doubling the sound. Um, but, yeah, just throwing that out there. Yeah, that, sure, and that's that's a fine interpretation. In fact, I've heard Muslims use it on a few occasions because they believe that Jesus was not crucified. I'm sure you've heard that, and they believe that he was... They, they don't believe he's the Son of God. They believe he was just a prophet, and so they believe that he was spared the crucifixion, and they actually use this verse as, uh, for that reason. They say, look, the, Isaac was spared, and so they believe that Jesus was spared too. So that interpretation is... If I, I won't give it credence by saying it's viable, I'll just say that there are people who do take that interpretation. What I would suggest, though, as a perhaps counterpoint is this. Had Abraham killed Isaac, 
first of all, Isaac was the child of promise, right? So God had told Abraham, through your son Isaac, you know, your seed will be called, and he's going to have a, you know, a nation will spring forth from him, all that. And Isaac was the one through whom God had promised all these things. And so if Abraham killed Isaac, and Isaac had died, none of the promises could have come true. Now, New Testament commentary says that Abraham had believed God's promise so that even if he had killed Isaac, Abraham believed that God would have to raise him from the dead in order to fulfill the promise. And so it's by virtue of his faith in this, in the power of God to reconcile those things and even the resurrection of the dead that his faith was reckoned to him as righteousness. Um, now, obviously, the Tanakh, the, or specifically Genesis, does not specifically say that, and so that, that's also an interpretation as well. Um, but anyways, all we're, let's try and keep it focused. It is my fault for rabbit trailing a little bit. Let's focus again on this idea of atonement, where atonement comes in, what is its importance, and can we totally disregard the idea of it today? Because we don't have a temple. We haven't had one for 2,000 years. There are not sacrifices being made today. And what is, what is that? What is the meaning of that um, for us as Jews today? Or what does it mean for the world? A new covenant. <clears throat> A new covenant? Why, why do you say that? Jesus said, this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Sure, but let's say I don't believe in Jesus. Let's say I'm not ready to go there yet or at all. Let's try and keep this again, Tanakh, Old Testament focus. Where, where do you get this? Is there even an idea of a new covenant in Tanakh? I mean, because they gave, I mean, the Jews were given the Mosaic covenant. So why do they need, why do they need a new covenant? Jeremiah? I'm looking at you. Um, ask the question again. I'm kind of lost in all this. I'm just curious. I've never heard of this new covenant thing idea. I mean, I, I'm a Jew. I've got the Mosaic covenant. So why would I need a new covenant? And I, I'm talking to you, Jeremiah, for a reason. I'm guessing because you are referring to uh, uh, the Brit Hadashah, which is mentioned in the book of Jeremiah. Is it really? Would you want to share that with us? Loaded questions, Sean. <laughs> it's, the, it's the best I have to work with right now, unfortunately. Well, how do we even know? I don't know it off of heart, but... Um, would it help you? Would it aid you for me to pull it up on my, my screen? It, it would not age me a minute. Age you? No, aid you. I'm trying to oh, help aid you. me. <laughs> I'm trying no. to put you in an early grave by showing you scripture. Behold, days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, not like a, the covenant which I made with their fathers when I brought them out of the land of Egypt, which they broke. Um, but this is the covenant I will make with my people. In that day I will put my law in their hearts and in their minds, I'll write it. I will be their God. They will be my people. I think that's it. Yeah, Jeremiah 31, 31. You can look that up on the Chabad website if you're interested. Yeah, God promised a new covenant. A okay, new covenant. but Sean, you're, yeah. you're saying, you're using words that Christians use, like new covenant. Well, hold on. Of course Christians no, use them, but where do we get that from? Right, but I'm saying most most of... Most Jewish people, right? We don't we don't use the term uh, new covenant. You know, it's not something that's in our vocabulary. So, what exactly does it mean? Well, I'm I'll throw that out to the room then. What does it mean? Like, how do how do you, as a Jewish person, because saying it's a Christian word or whatever is not entirely fair, because there it is in the Book of Jeremiah. The old was broken. That is what it says. It says the old was broken, right? And whatever unfamiliarity, sorry, whatever unfamiliarity uh, Jewish people have with the New Covenant or not even expecting a New Covenant is only because of illiteracy um, or a lack of interest in actually looking at what the Scriptures themselves say. Their own Scriptures, that is. I'm not even talking about the New Testament. I'm talking purely what the prophets of Israel said in the Tanakh. They clearly said there would be a New Covenant. 
Jeremiah, you were you were you had a thought. Uh, maybe I interrupted you. Continue. Um, no, I I didn't have another thought. I was just in in a lot of people that I speak with speak with about um, you know the covenants. It's uh, it, it's not really a Jewish understanding that there's a new covenant. You know, sure. because we say that we are we're we're people of of the Mosaic Covenant. Right, but doesn't this verse say that the Mosaic Covenant is broken? I I guess so. Yeah. What What, what do you mean? You guess? I mean, I I don't want to I don't want to put any, anything of me into this. When it says, you know, let me let me pull up the verse, and if anyone can read Hebrew, maybe we can read it in the original Hebrew in case I'm misunderstanding what it's saying. It seems to me that it says that. This is Jeremiah 31, 31. I'll put it up on the screen. I think that's the only way to do it. Here it is. All right, so 31, 31. Uh, not like the covenant that I formed with their forefathers on the day I took them by the hand to take them out of the land of Egypt, that they broke my covenant, although I was a lord over them, says the Lord, for this is the covenant I will form in the house of Judah after these days. So he's talking about a new covenant. In fact, it says it right here. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord. I will form a covenant with the house of Israel, the house of Judah, a new covenant. That's what it says. Michelle, how do you read that? I'm not sure. Okay. That's fair. But I think it's worth discussing. Now, we are reaching beyond uh, what we were originally discussing, which is just atonement, just a very basic concept. And yet we do find, now I, I grant that Jeremiah doesn't actually mention the word atonement here, but if you go down, there is something that links with atonement very, uh, very neatly which is that he says in verse 33 of chapter 31, um, Know the Lord, they all shall know me, from the smallest to the greatest, says the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and their sin, I will no longer remember. The reason I mention that is because atonement always has to do with this ransoming for the soul that has sinned, and we can show that throughout Scripture. That's not even controversial. I mean, the Levitical priesthood was clearly set up to offer up sacrifices in atonement for sin. And the only reason we need to atone for ourselves, or have ourselves atoned for, is because we have sinned. That is the entire purpose of that ministry. So it seems this new covenant has a lot to do with atonement. It certainly has to do with the forgiveness of sins, and God putting away out of his own memory our acts of iniquity. So this new covenant sounds pretty good. I'd like to know more about it. Um, I think that maybe by new covenant it just means a renewal of the old covenant. Okay, and let's, I mean, I'd like to entertain all possibilities, but when it says that they broke my covenant, and when he says it will not be like the covenant that I formed with them on this day, that's Jeremiah 31, 31, how can it be a renewal of the old when it's saying, number one, they broke the old, and number two, the new one will not be like the old one? Maybe it won't be like the old one because this time it won't be broken. Okay, that's fair. That's fair. Anyone else would like to comment? I agree with Michelle. You agree with Michelle? That's cool. So what does the New Covenant have to do with uh, the, this topic of... Uh, Atonement? Well, it's because of its interesting phraseology concerning the forgiveness of sins and putting away iniquity and all that, because it reminds me of what Daniel said of the same thing, uh, talking about a covenant in relation to the forgiveness of sins. It seems to be very similar to what some of the other prophets were saying, and so... When you take scripture as a whole and you start sort of making cross-references where you see the prophets are all talking about the same thing, the picture becomes a little clearer. And I'd be happy to bring up Daniel chapter 9, which I have in my mind to do. I think there's an uh, interesting, uh, uh, an interesting uh, uh, some verses in Ezekiel 24, uh, verses, uh, let's see here. Uh, verses 6, 7, 8, and uh, if you, we continue up to verse 13. And uh, I think we can see a connection uh, to atonement and the wrath of God there. Would you like to read it for us? Yeah, sure. Uh, verse 6 says and starts like this. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, Woe to the bloody city, to the pot whose corrosion is in it, and whose corrosion has not gone out of it. 
take out of it piece after piece without making any choice. Verse 7, for the blood she has shed is in her midst. She put it on the bare rock. She did not pour it out on the ground to cover it with dust. To rouse my wrath, to take vengeance, I have set on the bare rock the blood she has shed, that it may not be covered. And then verse 13 says, on account of her unclean lewdness, because I would have cleansed you, and you were not cleansed from your uncleanness. You shall not be cleansed any more till I have satisfied, satisfied my fury upon you. Mm -hmm. So fury, another word there for wrath. Uh, and I think uh, we, we have blood here. And uh, the rock supposedly be Jerusalem, I think. Very well. Okay, so I was t thinking of Daniel because of what Jeremiah says in 33 of 31. It says, 70 weeks of years have been decreed upon your people and upon your city and sanctuary to terminate the transgression, to end sin, to expi uh, expiate iniquity. That's an interesting English word, expiate. I'm wondering if that comes from the root word in Hebrew for atonement. I'll have to look that in the Hebrew. And to bring in eternal righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, to anoint the most holy, it goes on to say that the Mashiach is the one who's going to, to do this. That's verse 26. So, we are going, we're reaching a little further than I had originally intended. It's just sort of sometimes difficult because I get excited when I start looking at verses like these because honestly, I mean, the, the, the core of all religion is this idea of coming to God in a way that is pleasing to him. Good good time to transition into something else if <laughs> before I remember. I, I have a question for the room. Why can, can the room hear you? The room yeah. can hear me through you. Why do we need atonement in the first place? Right. Why why can't we just ask for forgiveness and God forgive well, us? what does atonement to, mean? To appease what does the wrath mean? of God. That sounds, I mean, if I asked you to show me a, a segment from Torah or Tanakh that says atonement is there to appease the wrath of God, you're, you probably won't find a verse that says that clearly. That's more of a theological explanation that you've formed, and one that I, of course, adhere to, in, indeed, but we want to do it in a way that for the uninitiated, for the layman, or for the person who resists that idea, how do we begin to build that theology without bringing our own interpretations to the text? How do we just look at what it says and just and just come to the, the natural conclusion? Hmm. Okay, well, let me give you a suggestion on how, how to begin looking at this. Uh, Cain and Abel, you know, God says through Isaiah, I declare the end from the beginning, so I like to look at the first appearance of a particular idea to try and help me understand how I should interpret it later. That seems to be a reasonable hermeneutic to me, because how can you understand the end of something if you don't understand how it began? Um, you don't flip to the end of a book before reading the first part. And so God sets up this idea of Cain and Abel coming to offer up a sacrifice to the Lord. Right at the beginning of human history, you've got this major split between one who is accepted by God and one who is rejected by God. And if we can understand who was accepted and why, and who was rejected and why, we can then aspire to be like the one who was accepted. And I think we'll find that the one who was accepted, Abel, is very consistent throughout the rest of Scripture as being the one who was the prototype by which all others who would be acceptable to God would also conform to his own uh, model or his picture. That is to say this, Abel had a sacrifice, um, it says the firstlings of his flock, which I assume were sheep or lambs, was brought to the Lord and was accepted. And that's fairly consistent with everything we've talked about so far today, about this idea of lambs being slain for atonement. That's what happened on the Day of Atonement after all, when Yom Kippur arrived on the calendar. And then you've got Cain, quite to the contrary, he does something rather different. He, he he brings a sacrifice to the Lord, sure, but it's not a sacrifice in the sacrificial sense of a life being taken. He rather brings the fruit of his own labor. Uh, scripture often talks about our mitzvah being as our, our works or our fruit. And I, I don't want to reference the New Testament, but Jesus would often say, you know, you'll know them by their fruit, meaning their work, the things they do. 
And so if that is a, and there definitely is somewhere in the Tanakh where it, it makes the analogy of fruit being um, a way to an, a allegorize or a, a nap, what's the word? Fruit being a metaphor for work or a, another word for it. This idea of doing mitzvah to appease God, uh, to atone for our iniquity, or just by being good enough, giving God your best, that seems to be what Cain was doing. He, he gave him the best. He gave him the first fruit of his, whatever, his garden, but God said, no, I do not accept. Now, I, I don't want to say any more on that yet. I, I'd like to hear your what you guys think. That's, that's fair. Um, I know we don't have very many representatives in the room um, from the Jewish community, and by Jewish I don't mean just Jewish ethnically, I mean Judaism rabbinically. So I, I don't want to say, hey, you, and then say a name, what is your response? I don't want to put anyone on the spot. But if any representatives of the Jewish community have anything to say about what I just said, I'd be willing to listen. <laughs> Or I'll just keep talking, because I'm good at that. I am good at talking. Why exactly does uh, God use so many metaphors? That's a good question. Anyone? Okay, let's ask a different question before we ask why does he use so many metaphors. The question is, does God use metaphor? That's a better question. Many Cause times. I'm, well, because I'm interpreting Cain and Abel metaphorically, and I'm by no means saying it wasn't an actual event in human history. What I'm saying is God very purposefully ordained that this event take place as instructional to the rest of humanity for all of time. But why would I ever think that? Is there anything in Scripture that says God does things like that? Loaded question, right? Obviously he does. So let me, <laughs> let me pull up the verse. It's in, uh, it's in Hosea, actually. I believe. Yep, Hosea 12.10. Um, I just searched it on Google, so forgive me if this... Ah, maybe I will look it up on Chabad just for... Yeah, let me go to Chabad. That way no one gets upset that I'm using like a King James or whatever. So let's go to Chabad. I'm going to head out. We thank you for joining us and hope you will again. All right, thank you. All right, Hosea chapter 12, verse 10... There you are. If any representatives of the Chabad website are watching this, I want to compliment you on the navigation of your scripture verses. I think it could be a little bit easier, but for the most part, pretty good. Not bad. All right, so 12.10. Am I in chapter 12? Hosea chapter 12, verse 10? Okay, good. Verse, well, they have it as verse 11, so it, it does differ from the King James Version. I'll bring it up on the screen. It is just a short verse, but I might as well get in here. I'm flipping between so many windows. I apologize that sometimes it takes me a minute. Uh, let's see. There it is. Beautiful. Okay. This is Hosea chapter 10, verse 11. I spoke to the prophets, this is God speaking, and I increased their visions, and to the prophets I assumed likenesses. Now, other versions, like the King James, say stuff like similitudes or similarities or parables, or um, this one says parables, parables, another pro parables. Parables seems to be the most popular one. Yeah, King, James. I really want King James says, I've also spoken by the prophets and I've multiplied visions. I've used similitudes by the ministry of the prophets. It's this idea of that the prophets, let me switch back to screen, there we go. The prophets had a very interesting ministry, and this, the word prophet, I mean, if you ask, um, if you ask a rabbi who, who is considered a prophet, is it just the people called the prophets, or can we consider Cain and Abel, or specifically Abel a prophet, or is Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, are they prophets? They certainly uttered prophecies, Jacob uh, being the most verbose of them all when he sort of did his old benediction with his with his sons. But the point is, anyone who is sort of a patriarch of the faith is sort of understood to be um, prototypical of the things of faith. And so if, if Abel is to be understood as prophetic, the question is, what is he being prophetic of? And if he is being prophetic of this idea of sacrifice being that which allows a sinner to approach God and be acceptable to him, that seems to fit very well, very well. In fact, 
as far as I'm concerned, that is the best interpretation because it's the most consistent. <laughs> All right. I believe this is the first time. I'm going to actually go to my sound effects. Silence! I no. Kill you. No, that's not what I want. <laughs> I was looking for crickets. Oh. I was looking for crickets. <laughs> that was pretty bad. All so, right, sound so Sean. Yeah, what's up, Jeremiah? Or Venom Fang, whichever you prefer. You're, you're throwing out a lot of uh, big theological words, and I'm just kind of curious as to how many people are... Savvy? Yeah, like, uh, I'm curious as to the, the backgrounds of, of people in the room, if they're understanding kind of the, the terminology that you're talking about, or if they're coming from a different perspective. I'm interested in that, too. In fact, I would love to stop listening to myself talk for a few minutes and let you guys just go to town. So, does anyone understand or not understand the things we've spoken of so far, and does anyone want to disagree? Because we want people to voice their opinions and not just my opinions. Well, I have a question for everyone, and hopefully I won't echo. Uh, is, is everyone here in this room a follower of Jesus. Yes. Raise your hand. Well, there's a half raise, and then there's no raise. Okay, is anyone here Jewish? Okay, so we're talking about Jewish theology and these ideas, so I'm wondering if you guys are, if you know anything about it already, and if, if you don't, uh, what, what's your thoughts on what's going on here? Do you even know what rabbi is? It's like a teacher, right? It's like that, yeah. That's exactly what a teacher is, is a rabbi. That's okay, good. so this is what I suggest. We need to clear out some of the rooms so we can get some uh, Jewish people that will debate the topic, that have some knowledge about it. And what I'm going to do is post the link of where you can see this live so we can get more people in. And I'm going to start ejecting a couple people. Ban Hammer? Ban Don't Hammer. So, thank you guys for coming in. And we're going to continue as soon as we get some more people who have not the same opinions as us. All right. So, if you're that person, feel free to just leave before I boot you. Yes, I mean, obviously it would be better if you guys leave willingly as opposed to by force, especially if we're just trying to get people in the room who want to engage with the material rather than just get FaceTime. Wait, so why exactly are you guys booting people? Uh, we want to get more people that can debate the subjects. And we want to get more questions flowing. So we only have room for 10 people, and if it's filled with people that don't know what to say after a statement, we got to move on. But you can keep watching, and actually, any comments you write, we can see them on the YouTube feed. And so if you have a question, post it there. I'll put it in our chat, and it will probably come up in the next question. I will say this, though, Sean. Before we boot anyone, why don't we just say, if you guys came on this channel or this uh, live feed and you wanted to say something, ask a question, make a comment, now would be the time to do it before we have to make some more room. Although it looks like there is a few open slots in the room right now, so we don't need to necessarily kick anyone else. Uh, well, I have a question. Sure, great. Um, basically, I was, uh, I was watching a movie before I was able to join the browsing, and uh, you guys were talking about like the New Covenant and the Renewed Covenant. Yes. I was just wondering, like, is like is it a renewed covenant or does the new covenant replace the Mosaic covenant? Like, I'm, I was a little. Yeah, bit we were discussing that, and so one interpretation is, yeah, it's just a renewal of the old one. I don't see how that's viable, seeing as the old covenant was broken. That's Jeremiah thirty-one, thirty-one, and it says specifically that it will not be like the old one. After all, the old one was broken. So, giving a new one, which is identical to the old one. It seems that would just get broken again, too. Like, what, what's the difference? Why is this new one going to be a, a viable option to 
make good on what the old did not. Um, and then, when we start to define the nature of this new covenant, specifically being the forgiveness of sins, the end of iniquity, in conjunction with uh, what Malachi said, that the Lord himself would come to the temple, that's Malachi chapter 3, and give this covenant, and then also as well with uh, Daniel 9, which says the Mashiach would be the one who would bring the everlasting righteousness and the end of sin before the destruction of the second temple, you start to put that all together and you get a different view of the new covenant than merely reinterpreting it as a renewal of the Mosaic one, because I don't see how that's viable. Even if it is the renewal of the Mosaic covenant, well, how, how do you renew... I think I just got muted. No? I'm just no longer hearing an echo. That's good. No, you're not muted. Okay. Yeah. Even if it's just a renewal of the Mosaic Covenant, what that means is that the Jewish people will be returning, either, or were supposed to have returned, or will at some point in the future, to all the Mosaic things that they were doing in their history. So that includes the animal sacrifices, that includes, um, you know, not mixing cotton with certain clothing, and the dietary laws, and everything that goes into um, Old Covenant, Old Testament, Judaism, not rabbinic Judaism, as um, is understood today or as, as is practiced today. And so even even if you want to say that uh, this new covenant is just a renewal of the old one, what that puts the rabbis in a position of today is that they are in gross error. Because okay. uh, uh, apparently, apparently this new covenant, if it, if it is a renewal of the old, and they're not practicing the old, because remember they broke it, that means either way, either way they're in serious trouble. Either they're not uh -huh. in that covenant right now, and therefore they're in trouble, or they've missed the new covenant, and therefore are in trouble. Either way, it doesn't bode well for um, for modern day Judaism. Okay. I don't know if that answers your question, or if anyone else has any thoughts on that. Sean, I was wondering, how do the Jewish people atone for their sins without the sacrifices? You said they don't have a temple, mm. they don't do sacrifices. How do they atone for their sins without, you know, Jesus? They would suggest that prayer and repentance in conjunction with, um, well, certainly not blood sacrifice or animal sacrifice of any of any nature, they no longer have the temple, and so um, they've had to redefine what it means to be made right with God through and without atonement as classically defined in, in their own scriptures. And so they would say prayer and repentance, and particularly on a specific day of the year, the day of Yom Kippur, the day of atonement. So if you if you go to synagogue and pray and repent on that day, then you're good for the next 365 days or something like that. It's it's really kind of mysterious. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, I noticed something earlier that you guys said. Um, well, that um, atonement is basically a, the appeasement of God's wrath. But I think I would argue that atonement is, um, well, I'm a Christian, so I believe Christ's blood frees us from the chains of death rather than appeasing the wrath of God. Um, that's what I pretty much gained from the scriptures. I would suggest to you, as a believer in Yeshua, as a believer in Mashiach as well, that his sacrifice was more than either of those things, but includes both of them at the same time. So, did he appease the wrath of God? Yes. Does he, does, through the power of his resurrection, does that give us entrance into eternal life? Yes. And more. He paid a ransom. He purchased us. You know, someone mm. someone said, um, you know, how could how could God torture his children in hell, or how could God sentence his children to suffer? And on and on it goes. The whole point of what Christ did, if you read the Gospel of John, is that he repurchased for himself a people who previously were not his people. Those who are by nature sinners are not children of God. It's Christ who it's Mashiach who gives us the right to become the children of God, and he, he redeems us, he owns us, and that's where this whole, you know, people get so upset with this idea of slavery in the Old Testament, when they don't realize that, in a strange sort of way, this idea of redeeming a person and purchasing them and making them your property also puts them under your protection and into, into your house. And so when we're purchased by God from our sin, when we're atoned for and purchased by God, we become owned by him. And when that happens, he adopts us as sons, the scriptures say. He takes his servants and adopts them as sons, and that is what salvation is. We go to be with the Lord in his house forever. That sounds pretty good to me. Yeah. Especially because amen. I started, yeah, amen, because I started as an enemy of God, 
And then, like, you know, do you remember the prodigal son? He comes, comes back to his father, and he's like, I'm not even worthy to be your servant. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I'm the lowest of the low, when he recognized his great evil. And the father then robed him and with honor and said, you know, you're my son. And so, you know, I, I, I tell you a story right now, but it's a little graphic. Um, maybe this isn't the best format to do it. But um, I was telling it, I was in a chat with someone, and, I, well, now I'm telling the story. Um, oh. Yeah. Maybe, <laughs> maybe, maybe another time. Maybe it's inappropriate. Time. Yeah, it shouldn't. It's inappropriate only because the contrast of and I can't, I can't. Never mind. All right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, All but right. um. It's a good story, like, though. Take my word for it. I believe you, <laughs> but isn't like death? Um, it's basically separation from God, and sin, there's two deaths. Death is a natural result of sin. Well, yeah, there are two deaths. The scriptures speak of mortal death, which is when the body and the soul are separated. Mm -hmm. And then there is the second death. This is the lake of fire. This is where the body and the soul are reunited, and then both are separated from God. And so, you know, we, we have a saying in, in our circles, you know, born once, die twice, or born twice, die once. So, mm -hmm. Hey, Sean, I got a question. Um, they, uh, I've heard some people saying that um, hell is not eternal. And it's a very prolonged period of time. Is that true, or is it very uh, eternal and forever? Okay, well, I could answer this a few different ways, and the best way to do it, given our specific interest here, is what does the Old Testament, the Tanakh, say? Because New Testament clearly teaches hell is forever. Jesus himself taught that. Um, but the question is, where does that idea come from? Does it have any history in, in rabbinic literature or specifically the Word of God in the, in the Old Testament? The answer is yes, but don't let me just say yes. Let me show you the verses. Uh, Daniel chapter 7 talks about the great judgment when a river of fire comes out from the throne. And then it goes on to say that many will be raised, some to everlasting life, some to everlasting punishment. But let me bring up that exact verse so you don't have to take my word for it. Um, that's Daniel chapter 12, verse 2. I'll pull it up on the Chabad website. And while I look for it, by all means, feel free to fill the air silence with comments, questions, singing, if anyone wants to sing a little song for me. I posted a text comment over there. I don't know if you see that, Sean. I can't see it because I'm surfing the web right now, but if someone else wants to see it and tell me what's going on. You said, what does the Old Testament say about uh, Sheol, or I think that's also called the grave. Doesn't, isn't that what the Old Testament refers to as hell? The first mention of Sheol, I believe, is by the lips of Abraham when he says, I will go down to Sheol morning when his son, when he thought uh, Joseph, excuse me, it was Israel, Jacob. Yeah, so Jacob, Israel, he was the one, I think he first uttered the word Sheol, said he would go down to the go down to Sheol in mourning because of his son Joseph. So, yeah, that's the first mention of this idea of a afterworld life death thing. Um, what about uh, eternal darkness, too? Isn't that also in the Old Testament? The phrase eternal or outer, darkness. I'm sorry, outer, outer, outer. Outer darkness sounds a little more Old Testament to me. Let me just look at this one verse, and then we'll also look at that. That may require a Google search. Okay, so check this out. Daniel chapter 12. Now, this is the Chabad website, and I, the reason I use Chabad is because typically in Jewish circles, this is probably the translation they would be most comfortable with, and I'm totally okay with that, even though I find some of the other English translations to be a little more, I don't want to say more honest with the text, but rather they translate it in a way that seems to be a, a little more literal than to, to what the original Hebrew was, was saying. So, anyways... This is what it says. Hopefully you guys can see my screen. It says, Many who sleep in the dust of the earth will awaken. These for eternal life. So obviously, you know, when there are people, even in conservative or reform Judaism, say there is no resurrection from the dead. There is no... This doesn't go... I'm not by any means saying any particular group denies the resurrection, but I know some who do. So anyways, so after they die, who sleep in the dust of the earth, you know, from dust we come, dust shall we return, these will awaken to eternal life. So this is the resurrection of the dead. And... Those for disgrace, for eternal abhorrence. Now, how can you eternally abhor someone? Now, that word abhorrence is not what the Hebrew word here is. Uh, I find some of the other, as I was saying, some of the other English. Some of the English say punishment. 
uh, some say contempt, everlasting contempt. It's this idea of they will be looked upon forever as being not good. But you can't look on something unless it's there. And so where do you get this idea, and do we get this idea of having objects of God's wrath being essentially trophies of God's wrath forever, that they remain in existence forever, and yet they're in this uh, st status of, of punishment and contempt. Isaiah um, actually mentions this idea, that, that where their worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched, and they're a contempt to all flesh upon the earth. And Anyways, let me pull that verse up. I think that's Isaiah 66. Um, let me see. Yep, that's Isaiah 66, 24. Let me pull that up on the Chabad website. Now listen, I know t talking about hell is really uncomfortable and stuff, but listen, the only reason you could ever be concerned about having your sins atoned for, and I mean, it's one thing to want to get to eternal life and all that and make sure you're there, but really, if we just go out of existence when we die, whether or not I miss the kingdom of God or not, I mean, if you love God and you want to be with him, that's great, but... It's just not a whole picture. It's like, imagine telling a person, listen, how would, you, how would you like to go to heaven when you die and spend forever with God? Well, if the person doesn't really care much about God, they'll say, whatever, I'd rather just go to sleep forever. And, and that be that. And so if we go around telling people, don't worry, you're just going to die and go out of existence. Well, you know, in Seventh-day Adventist circles, they say that they believe in annihilationism. The wicked are annihilated and the righteous go on to eternal life. Yeah. For me, you know, if I'm having a depressed day where it's like, oh, I don't feel like going on anymore, maybe I'd just rather go to sleep forever, that doesn't seem to be much of an incentive to take this seriously. So let's go to Isaiah 66, verse 24, and see if we can uh, get something, something out of it. Yeah, I've, I'm going to bring it up on the screen. This is, again, the Chabad website. And it shall be from a new moon to new moon, from Sabbath to Sabbath, that all flesh shall come to prostrate themselves before me, says the Lord. Um, I'd love to do a teaching on what's going on here. This is the new heaven. Oh, well, it says right here above. For us, the new heavens, the new earth that I'm making stand before me. So, should, anyway, so there's going to be this. This is the new world that we're all looking forward to. And it goes on. And they shall go out and see the corpses of the people who rebelled against me, for their worms shall not die, and their fire shall not be quenched, and they shall be an abhorring for all flesh. Now, granted, that specifically doesn't say these people are going to hell, and it doesn't specifically say the lake of fire or some of these new uh, testament phraseologies to it. But just taking this, this idea of even in the new world, even in the new world we'll be able to look upon something, and it says those who had rebelled against God, and look upon them, and their fire is not quenched, and their worm does not die in conjunction with Daniel, who says they shall be raised to everlasting contempt, it seems to suggest, on a just a very basic and cursory reading, that whatever they're being resurrected to, this judgment, um, is not just a sort of this willy-nilly, okay, sorry, and you're leaving existence, you're, you're done. It, it seems to be more of an active role in being uh, punished by God. It, that seems to be the reality of it. Uh, there's other verses I could find to suggest that, but I'll let you chew on that for a second and comment about it while I look up a few other verses. Anyone? Yeah, I'm not too sure about... Uh, I, I used to um, you know, read online about annihilation versus you know, eternal punishment, and I'm really not too sure exactly which, which one sure. is... Uh, Valid. But you did say you were a Christian, right? Yes, I am a Christian. That's fair. Do you believe that there will be a lake of fire? Yeah, I do. I just don't know whether, like, see, the annihilation, uh, like, I don't believe in annihilation, but, you know, they have this, uh, I think their point of view is that the lake of fire is, like, you're punished in hell, and then hell itself is thrown into the lake of fire, and then the ashes are what's eternal. I mean, the smoke is what's eternal, so it's just they're annihilated completely. I think that's what they believe. Yeah, Revelation, um, I try not to, specifically when we're doing a show about, you know, Old Testament, Old Covenant sort of terminology, I don't want to have to reference the New Testament 
mm-hmm. in fear of alienating my audience. But when it talks about you know death and hell being thrown into the lake of fire, who, you, you know. To get a definition of the lake of fire, who else has been thrown in there? Well, it says that Satan and the false prophet and the beast were thrown in there, and it yeah. says that they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. And so could it be that you know, particular groups are yeah, no. remain forever in suffering and particular other groups are evaporate? I just, you know, the part of me, believe me, part of me says I hope that that's true. Yeah. You know, but... It's not my place to say. All I see is, again, I'm, I just want to look at what the Old Testament says. Talking about the Day of Judgment in Daniel chapter 7, verse number 9, it says, So thrones were set in place, the, ancients, uh, the Ancient of Days took his seat, his clothing was as white as snow, the hair of his head was white like wool, his throne was flaming with fire, and its wheels were all ablaze, and a river of fire was flowing, coming out from before him, and it goes on to explain, you know, the, the final judgment and then the opening of the books of life. And then it goes on, you know, in my vision, uh, one like the Son of Man coming on the clouds, and that's the, the, the idea of the Son of Man coming from heaven. Looks like we're about wrapping up, guys. Um, I apologize if this wasn't as interactive as um, we may have hoped last week. I, I know there was a lot more people talking. So th- take that as an encouragement to the audience to um, come in and interact and contribute, even if you have a completely different point of view and want to challenge me on everything I say, in fact, we would welcome that. And so we encourage you, please join us next week on uh, this channel. I'll post the link at the bottom of how you can sign up for the event next week. And I want to thank everyone for attending. Um, We'll close up in about a few minutes. If anyone else has anything they wanted to say, suggestions, comments, questions, just want to say hi, maybe even give a little testimony, anything. Sean, can I go ahead and read a a scripture real quick? Please. Hebrews 9.22, In fact, the law requires that nearly everything be cleansed with blood, and without the shedding of blood there is no forgiveness. And obviously with our uh, Christian theology, Jesus was God and man, and his eternal Godhead is what saves us eternally. Um, I think hell is eternal. I don't see any other way around it, and that's really all I wanted to say. Unfortunately, you know, no one wants to go to hell. No one wants anyone to go to hell. It's terrible. Indeed, I mean, and that's why God labors so diligently to save people from that that's fate. Right. He he doesn't want anyone to suffer it because if if it was no. if annihilationism was true, you know, I don't if 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 God at the end of it all is just going to eject people from existence, why didn't he just do that rather than flood the world? and keep this whole drama going. It seems to me that he's very much concerned with the souls of people so much that he enacted this entire plan of salvation. As far as the the quote from um, Hebrews, from the New Testament, Leviticus 17.6, the priest is to sprinkle the blood against the altar of the Lord at the entrance of the tent of meeting and burn the fat as a pleasing aroma to the Lord. If you read Leviticus, everything was consecrated by blood. Everything. Without exception. The people themselves were sprinkled by blood. This idea of sprinkling, sprinkling was the priestly method by which the blood was a, sort of a covering and a consecrating unto, unto God for, for the people and the items in the priestly system. It says in Isaiah 52 and 53 that the servant of the Lord will sprinkle many nations, and that's this idea of whatever was happening in Israel at that time where God was making a covenant with the people when he was sprinkling them and consecrating them unto himself, which is really how God brings people into his covenant. Here we have the servant of the Lord who's going to do the same thing for the world. So I recommend to our audience, check out Isaiah 49, 52, and 53. Ask yourself, who is this? This one who will sprinkle the nations through his death, burial, and resurrection. We here in the Jews for Jesus office in San Francisco believe that it is none other than Yeshua, HaMashiach, Jesus the Christ. And so we invite you to join us next week here on What the Rabbis Won't Tell You. Thank you so much for joining us. Shalom. And if anyone wants to say our closing words, I will just say my name is Sean, and it's been an absolute pleasure. Thanks, Sean. God bless you. You too. Right. Thanks, Sean. Appreciate the conversation. My pleasure. Cool. If any of you guys have any friends or family who don't know Jesus and uh, are Jewish or not, Chunk. they can still hear me and they can see me here. Ah. And uh, you know they're on Google. Invite them next week, Wednesday, same time, same place, to come and be a part of the show. 
and then you guys watch live from YouTube so we can get people in here who may not agree with everything you say. Is that fair enough? All right, well, Sean, I could only hear you by virtue of me sitting in the same room as you, so I will reiterate what Sean just said, which is, could you guys hear what Sean said? Yeah. Yeah? Yeah? Then I don't need to reiterate yeah. anything. Yeah. That makes my job really easy. All I need to do is push this button and bring this to a close. All right, folks, until next time. Adios.